Welcome to the Alpha Girl Confidence Podcast, where we are empowering youth female athletes to play and live confidently. My name is Shay Hatto, and each week I will bring you new episodes to teach you the strategies and tools that you need in order to live a confident, empowered life both on and off the playing field. What's up and welcome back to the show. Today is episode 174 and I am so excited to share this episode with you where I had the chance to sit down with Lou Arsenault who is an author, professional soccer player, coach, and speaker. She's a world traveler who is passionate about inspiring younger generations to reach their goals and pursue their dreams. In this episode, we dive deep into the power of trusting your intuition, why we all need to build more reflection and stillness into our daily life, and how changing your perspective can help you to overcome any tough situation in life. This episode is one of the most powerful episodes that I've ever recorded, and so I'm so excited for you to dive into this episode where it's going to be valuable for players coaches, and parents. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Really take in what Lou has to offer because if you do, I know this episode has the power to change your life. All right, enjoy. Hey Lou, what's up and welcome to the show, girl. Hey, what's up? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, excited to have you on. I know we've talked a little bit before this, but I'm excited to really dive into your story. I feel like you have like such an in-depth story um, that I know we're going to pull a lot of topics out. So let's first get into that and just kind of share who you are in a nutshell, kind of your your sports background and kind of what you do now. Yeah. So first I want to open up with, you say I have a lot of, of things going on, but somebody first told me one time that uh, there's an and in life, not just a this or a that. And I, when I heard that for the first time, I like embraced it. So um, that's kind of tra- how I try to live my life now. <laughs> I love that. But back to your question. Uh, my name is Lou. I'm from Canada, New Brunswick, to be more precise. So it's above Maine, far east. Um, I grew up playing soccer and then I'm um, in high school. All my high school was in French. And then I went to um, college in the United States in English. I went to school in Alabama for four years and I did a master's degree in Mississippi for three. And I got to coach the collegiate team, which was fun. And then all throughout those summers, I played on the WPSL team. So I played anywhere between like Maine, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, things like that. And then I transitioned into, I played pro, I played pro in, in California in 2012, then did a year sabbatical and played pro in Finland in 2016. Then transition to pro futsal for about a year and a half. And then now I play pro beach. Man. I, do, I know. <laughs> and did I, did I read correctly in your, on your website that you've been to all 50 states? I did. So that was a goal of mine um, before 30. I'm aging oh. myself, guys. So, but um, I got to do all the 50 states before the age of 30, which was great. When, okay, here's a fun question. Which one is your favorite? That's a great question. So I would have to say I'm partial to California because yeah. where I live now and I love right. it. But <laughs> the one that blew me away the most and I was really surprised was Alaska. Oh gosh. I, mean, I yeah. had to do some fun things. I went like ice climbing on these glaciers that the lagoons were so blue. I mean, it was phenomenal. Phenomenal. That's so cool. I, that's so cool. Um, yeah, because I know like in traveling, you've also traveled a ton. How much of that traveling was due to like soccer? Like whether it's coaching or playing in college and all that kind of stuff? So a lot of the states that I'd gone before, so probably I would say 30 of them is because of soccer. Okay. And then I had like 15 left towards the end and I decided to do a road trip. So my oh. parents actually flew in, we met in Montana and we did like all the mis- Midwestern states and all of that. So it was, it was good. That's such a cool, cool goal to, to have and to really <laughs> just be able to experience like life outside of what you're used to. And obviously being from, you know, living in two different countries, well, you lived in Finland too. So living in all those different countries is probably really opened your eyes to a lot of the world that a lot of us haven't seen. Yeah, it's definitely, I think the best teacher, you get to sort of embrace the new trust strangers, do things that you normally wouldn't step out of your comfort zone. Right. And I think that experience like that is some of the best teachers in my opinion. Yeah. And with that being said, I, I want to start this conversation off with, with your book. Cause I know that there's so many amazing lessons in there and so many things we can pull out of it. So first, before we kind of dive deep into it, give us just a broad overview of your book, what it's about, who it's for that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the book is a novel based on true events. It's more for like tweens, young adults, novel-ish. 
Um, and it, it, the story is about something that happened to me in 2014, but every chapter has a little bit of a life lesson. And the idea behind it is to trust your intuition, ignore your fears, um, trust you know what life has for you, and then just kind of embrace the adventure, essentially. Mm, I love that. So let's, let's yeah. dive into, uh, sure. into that. I love how you first started with trusting your intuition. <laughs> um, I love this topic because I feel like so many times, and I was the same way. And I, I'm just like, I would say when I turned 30, I just started figuring out, like, I actually know a lot more than I give myself credit for. Like if I trust my gut, trust my intuition, I don't need to go outside of myself all of the time. Mm-hmm. So when did you first start to like really become aware of your intuition and start like trusting it? Was it at a young age, like when you, you know, went through all your journeys in your book or was it after that? So that's a great question. So I think it was like what they call an unconscious competent, so to speak, because I'm, I'm doing these things and I, I don't know why I'm doing them, but I'm doing them because they feel somewhat right. But as I look back, cause I wrote the book 16 years after the event actually happened. Okay. So within the book itself, there's a little bit more insight from, or wisdom from like where I am now or when I was then in my life. Um, but I would say I've always been a pretty highly intuitive person. Um, just from a young age, I really liked reading people. I like social mm-hmm. cues. I like, because, and travel helps a lot. Um, yeah. especially from, you know, going from, um, fully French speaking, which I was bilingual, but to an English Mm -hmm. speaking. So sometimes at first there's a little bit of transition. So you're learning to use social cues and same when I moved to Finland, like I don't speak a lick of Finnish at (laughs) all. And the coach barely spoke English. The, the, the players did, but what was funny is he would like talk, talk, talk. And I'm like listening and looking to his hands, social cues, trusting. And then he one once in a while, he would just go like, low over there. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, you know, so it's kind of funny, but really all in all, when you, when you look at social cues and intuition, it leads you to do the right decision. And now that I'm older and I get to reflect a little bit on past experiences, you're able to analyze those for what they really truly were. And I think when I look back at my experience and, you know, I don't know that you're there yet, but I get to meet this family and they strangers and they ask me if I want to stay with them and I I say yes because it feels right you know I'm like I look at them I look at their, their demeanor what they look like sometimes people say that might be misleading or you know whatever but to me it felt right so I decided to trust it and it turned out great and now we're still friends you know 17, that's 18 so years cool later. yeah I actually I did make it to that part of the book and we won't like give away all the details <laughs> of the book but when I read that I was like oh my gosh I thought like something bad was gonna happen I was like oh no this is where she gets a like murdered <laughs> or like obviously yeah. get murdered but like sure, you know sure. it's like this is where something bad happens but it's like you were able to trust your intuition at such a young age and even though your mom freaked out of course I know I know you know and Bless but you're just like heart. you just gotta trust me um but why why like like specifically, let's talk for like teenagers, sure. right? Like why is learning to trust your intuition so important? And also second part of that question is how do we develop that skill? Is it a skill? So lots of, lots to unpack there. Yeah. To, to, uh, I'll start with the first question. So how do you, why, why is it important? To why trust is it important? Intuition? Okay. Thank you. I was thinking about the other one. So why is it I important? Too I think many questions. <laughs> <laughs> too many hard questions. My brain is going, so why is it important? I think Honestly, we're a society where we learn to look outwards of ourselves to get any sort of confidence or any validation. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the answers are always within, right? So we're always chasing something better, bigger. And we think happiness is an outward job when really it is an inside job. So when we go within ourselves to really look at really, how am I feeling? Not, Not how am I feeling about what society thinks I should be feeling. Mm. So, you know, um, society tells me that I need to fit in this mold and I need to do this, that, and the other, but all of those things that you're trying to achieve with society is standard sometimes doesn't bring happiness to us. And we feel that we need to be doing something different. So we know that feeling, we know that intuition and they're higher faculties, right? So we live life by what we hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. Mm -hmm. But whereas we have higher faculties, which are untangible to us, but they're very real, like your imagination, your reason, your will, your intuition. These are all things that we can develop. There are skills. Okay. So I think it's important for us to go inward because that's where true happiness lies. And it's a compass. That's your compass of life, right? You know, intuitively whether something is right or wrong, you know it, Mm -hmm. you don't know how you know it, but you know it, but we learn to, we learn to ignore that because of social norms and what Mm -hmm 
media, social media, society teaches us. Um, and I think sometimes we need to just go back to our roots. Um, Cause I heard, I mean, I think, um, I think it's like the, you're born with only two fears, the fear of lion noses and the fear of falling everything else you learn. Right. So all so these true. things that we're doing, we're learning from outward circumstances. So and the environment kind of shapes us, but it's important that we just go back within ourselves to be true to who we really are. Oh my gosh. I like, this is probably my favorite topic ever. Just the idea of like happiness isn't found in, in reaching goals and being accomplished and being validated. Like it really is an inside job. And I talk about this all the time with my girls. It's like a lot of times we think like when I reach this school, when I get the scholarship, when I get an A on this test, then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's really like when I'm happy, these things will happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's like so, so, so huge. Um, and you talked about, yes, it is a skill. So how does one um, start to kind of cultivate that and, and really be able to listen to it and trust it? So I think it needs to be in times of reflection. I think we're always packed with outer noise. Like it's funny because I coach and sometimes kids are like, oh, what do you listen to on the way to whatever? And I'm like, I don't listen to music. They're like, so you sit in your car in silence? And I'm <laughs> like, yes. It. And they're like, oh, they probably think I'm a psychopath. Yeah. But, you know, but reflection is the mother of learning. This is where we get to know ourselves. And if you're always constantly filling your brain with outer noise, television, a radio, or, you know, I mean, I'm not saying these things are all bad, but if you're always constantly filling your mind with these things, you don't get to think for yourself. Somebody else is doing your thinking for you. Mm -hmm. So when you take time to be by yourself and really ask yourself better questions, because our minds are programmed to answer questions. I don't know if you knew this, but if you say, if I tell you, is my shirt green in your head, you're like, no. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's always things. So, but we, we don't ask ourselves better questions. We just, we often just say statements. We're like, I'm not good enough. And then our brain accepts right. it as is, as opposed to like, what is the lesson in this? Or what can I learn from this? Now your brain starts thinking, oh, there is something I can learn. And it starts like figuring out all these ways where the lesson can be pulled out and then you can actually gain from it. So I think mm -hmm. spending time in reflection, um, quiet reflection, something going on a walk and not listening to anything, just admiring what's around you. And why do I feel this way outside? Why do I, you know, just asking better questions, I think will help um, you go inward and eventually you'll reconnect to the source. And sometimes when we don't think, like when there's a major event, you act, that's your intuition. Yeah. But you're like, why am I making the right decision in this moment? Because you're not thinking, right? Mm -hmm. You're not thinking right away. You're trusting your instincts. And I think that with all the outer noise, we are able to, well, we're not able to, we actually quiet that inner voice with all that mm -hmm. chatter. We just need to be able to listen to it again. This is huge. And I'm actually reading a book right now called Stolen Focus. And it talks okay. a lot about, um, about how like we're always just inundated with outside noise, with podcasts, with social media, and we don't mm -hmm. ever have time to daydream or, or think of our own ideas or like really just, you know, listen to what's going on around us. Um, and I have a question for you. Do you, so you said reflection, do you meditate at all? I'm um, in various form. I would say, yes. I don't know that it would yeah. be a traditional sit, listen to meditation. That's mm -hmm. good too. Mm -hmm. But like, for me, I like going on walks. I go on walks every day, not listening to anything. And that's a form of meditation to me because it's reflection. Um, again, I said, I'm calling myself out, but I'm often when I'm driving, I'm not listening to music. I'm just kind of like seeing what's around me and thinking, right? Just what can I do better? What, you know, what, what did I learn today? How can I, and some of the questions that I ask my kids often is, you know, how was your day? And then like, what did you learn from today? Who did you help? Mm -hmm. What are you grateful for? And who helped you? So it's forcing them to think something differently. And I think mm -hmm. that by doing just reflection like that, it could be kind of called meditation. Sometimes in the morning, I'll, I'll put an alarm on for just before my alarm goes on and I put a snooze and that's like visualization meditation kind yeah. of thing that I like to do as well. Right. So little moments like that. I don't think you need a lot of time, but I do do it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so important. Like I, I'm on day 26 of one hour of meditation every wow. single day. And for so me, wow. my meditation isn't, uh, I, it's not guided. There's no music. It's literally, I'm just listening to my thoughts. That's I don't great. push away my thoughts. I just listen to it. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes things come up and sometimes it's just the monkey mind, but it's just like right. learning to just be 
there, be present, not have to like go, mm-hmm. go, go all the time. Right. And I, and I want to stay on this topic just for a little bit longer because it's so yeah. important, but also like, it's so hard for specifically, I think like teenagers, but I think everybody to practice this reflection to like be more still to just notice what's going on around them. It's, I think it's so difficult for so many people yet. It's probably the thing that's changed my life the most. And the thing that I'm like really wanting to hit down on. Um, so I don't know, like, why do you, why do you think it's so hard? Um, and, and I don't know, like we're both going to have different perspectives and then, um, I'll, I'll start with just that one question. Why do you think it's so hard (laughs) to meditate or to just sit with our thoughts? just sit with your thoughts and just sit and we'll just say sit in silence really silence and to not always be listening to something and consuming something mm-hmm. well I think that's two part first part I think it's because from a young age again we're bombarded with all this information so I think it's like where we live in an, an area where it's instant gratification so mm-hmm. there's no more chance for kids to be bored because their days are structured and filled with different things. So when there are time for themselves, they don't know what that time is for most of them. And then they call it boredom Yeah. Or really it's self-discovery. Yes. Right. So when we're sitting with our thoughts, people equate or attach a negative connotation to some of these thoughts, right? Like sometimes, yeah. sometimes you think these things and you're, you don't, you're kind of rejecting, like you said, I'm not accepting or rejecting. I'm just kind of like, mm-hmm. let these thoughts pop into my mind. But what people don't understand is that like one, you are the think of your thoughts but you're not your thoughts so you you have thoughts you're not your thoughts but you're the thinker of your thoughts but the third part to that is that you become what you think about so you know it's like a little yeah true so you're not your thoughts you're the thinker of your thoughts but you eventually become what you think about so sometimes when a thought comes in we've embodied it as our own but honestly it probably is something that you've heard somewhere else that like you know we're taught a little bit of like you're not good enough. This, like that. And then, and you think about these things and are good enough. And you're like, God, and you're embodying this, but really you're not your thought. You're the thinker of my thought, which Mm -hmm. gives you then the power to change your thought. Yes. Right. And then eventually the more you think about something, you become it. So really what is that choice that you're making? You're not accepting it or rejecting it. It just is like, nothing is really good or bad until you relate it to something else. So So as that thought comes through, if you don't put emotion to it, say, bye, see you later. That thought keeps going. Then you can keep moving, progressing and moving forward with your life. Mm, I love that. It's like you, yeah. what you said, like, it's not good or bad until you make it. So, right. Like That's right. we judge it so often. It's like, Oh, this is bad. It's like, it, nothing is good or good or bad until right. you assign it that meaning. So I love that. Right. Um, I want to kind of last thing on this specific topic is I want to kind of know from you, what is something very practical that our listeners can do to start to get into more of this reflection and thinking and just silence, like something very easy asking yourself a question, but on paper, putting a question on paper, um, because they say that's like a problem written down is a problem half solved. Right? Yeah. So whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to grow into, write that thing down and just let the thoughts come down on paper. So that way now you're able to, because everything you can, you don't understand something you can until you can teach it to somebody else so that they can understand it. Yes. So when you're putting your words onto paper, it's, forcing your brain to actually articulate what the issue is and what the solution could be. So when you're asking yourself better question, you're able to actually, that's a good way to self-discover. That's why they say journaling is really important yeah. because you're, you're putting your thoughts down on paper and you're actually, you're taking this idea that you think you're feeling and defining it. Now understand too, that we're limited by the words that we know and the knowledge that we can write with. Mm-hmm. But if we're trying our best to kind of articulate our feelings, then it helps us delve deeper into who we really are. Mm-hmm. And then it gets, us the opportunity to get to know ourselves a little bit better. Yeah. And one of those questions, cause you keep bringing up like ask better questions. One of the questions that I'll ask myself when I notice like this, you know, negative recurring thought or something, I'll just ask myself, like, is this ultimately true? Cause so mm-hmm. often exactly. we believe every single thought we have. And then it's like that thing starts to, you know, we start to become that thought. Mm-hmm. So it's really asking yourself, like, is, is it ultimately true that I'm not good enough? Is it ultimately true mm-hmm. that I'll never, you know, go play college soccer, like whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I love just the, the journaling thing and it doesn't have to be this big, long practice. It could be like a five minute thing before mm-hmm. school. That's right. And you can also do like, I used to do, I did that for, I think three mm-hmm. years straight every day. And it was a gratitude journal, but it was 10 things that I was grateful for, oh, but sweet. the things I was grateful for 
sometimes I would write it in present current tense, even though they hadn't happened yet. So I'm already grateful for the things that I want to happen because, you know, and then we're diving a little bit into manifestation that, things yeah. like that. but again, we talked about you become what you think about, right? So if you're writing somebody like, I want to leave everybody I meet with the impression of increase. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing that now because I'm eventually embodying that person. And you said, we're always happy looking for the next thing next thing right oh when I get this this will be good when I get this this will be good well we don't set goals to get we set goals to grow so the journey is actually more important than the goal so this is why it's important for us to kind of like you know figure out what we want to become and be grateful for the things that we want in life so that way we can grow into that person that we ultimately would like to be Oh my gosh. I love that. Don't set goals to get set goals to grow. Okay. So let's, let's talk about goal setting then. Cause Great. you know, I used to be all about goal setting and then I, I don't really set goals anymore because I, I do in a way, but it's more of like, I'm just like open to things happening, how they need to happen. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. put in the work and it's all about the progress of putting in the work. But at the end of the day, like the outcome might be so much bigger than I can even imagine. Right. So for me, goals have, I don't know, I just, I've, I've developed a different relationship with goals and I would love to hear like more about, um, how you teach goal setting or how you personally goal set, um, and maybe how it's a bit different than, you know, typical mainstream goal setting is. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, letting things happen is very important too, but I've learned a long time ago that goals, each goal has a gestation and an incubation period. So mm-hmm. we know that if you plant a carrot seed after whatever it is, I think it's 180 days or 90 days or something, the carrot will start to sprout. We know these things because they work with the laws of like land and blah, blah, blah. We don't know, like a goal is like you're planting a seed, right? Yeah. So we don't know what the incubation period is and we don't know how long that's going to take. So sometimes we lose, um, yeah. we lose momentum in our goal. So, but the goal that we're setting for ourselves, we sometimes stamp a time to it. And if it doesn't happen by what we've Mm. dictated that it should happen, then we're like, yeah, that's, that's not going to work for me. Right. So I think we need to plant the seed and continue watering it. And when we're watering it, then it's like what you're doing, like letting things kind of like work themselves out, but you're also taking daily action towards what your goal is. And I think that's important because a goal not acted upon basically is just the wish. Yeah. So there's no nothing. So whatever that goal is, if you're really emotionally involved with that goal, you need to be taking steps towards that goal, knowing that the journey might take you left. It might take you right. You might take some steps back, but eventually with confidence, you're letting it, things work into place so that, because you know, within the inner knowing that you're going to reach that goal. I actually really love that thing of like, you don't need to put a timestamp on it. No. Because we, we do that all the time and it's like, oh, I didn't reach it. And so it's, it's just right. never going to happen. Um, but like, right. like you said, sometimes the goal that you have in mind, it may take way longer than, than you actually had accounted mm-hmm. for it, And that's okay. Um, so I, I love that just kind of taking away that piece and letting, letting it kind of take its own course, I think is very powerful. I agree, but there's a flip side to that too. Mm-hmm. And a task expands to the time allotted totally. to it. Right, right, right. right. So you need to find the balance. It's not like, oh, in 20 years time. And then, you know, 19 years later, you haven't done anything towards it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So a time expand, like a a task expands to the time allotted to it. So it's important Mm -hmm. to put a date to Mm -hmm. a goal, Mm -hmm. but it's important also to give yourself grace and an extension because then it gives you time to work towards that goal, knowing that it's not in some distant foreign mm-hmm. future where you're taking daily action steps towards it. Okay. That makes sense. So it's like you, yeah. you, when you do it, you have your goal date, so to mm-hmm. say, but mm-hmm. you're like, you're like, okay with it taking longer or, you know, happening sooner, but you're not right. like, you're not like tied or super attached to it happening on right. that date. That's right. Okay. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I love that. So with one more thing with goal setting is like, obviously the important part isn't the goal, but the action step. So how do you specifically, um, like when you set a goal, what do your action steps look like? So a lot of people start with, well, they set a goal and then they think of all the reasons it's not going to work. Mm, right? so yeah. then it's kind of like the idea becomes stillborn. So what we want to do is operate from, you know, the ideal backwards. So okay. I think it was Steve, uh, 
Jobs that said like you can never connect the dots moving forward. You can always yep. connect them moving back, right? So it's important for us to go. Okay, this is my goal. What do I need moving backwards to yeah. do to reach that goal? So mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, but um, I don't know. Let's say I want to become a better soccer juggler just for the sake of it, and my number is some, you know, whatever ten thousand. Okay, well, I need to get to ten thousand. Okay, I need to get to nine hundred. 950 whatever all of that and you need to move backward but what do I need to do now to help me get to the next step right so okay well maybe maybe I need to spend some time juggling a little bit during the day and then um, every day doing x y and z so that helps you kind of just have an idea of where we're we're striving for yeah taking daily steps towards it but you know that there is a way to get there even though you don't know the way it's kind of like the expression um like in the fog, when you're driving and your fog lights are on, you only see the next 200 feet that's in front of you, right? Mm. But you know that there might be a bend and you know, once you get there, the next 200 feet will be revealed. So it's like, you need to be taking these steps. So because the next answer or the next task ahead will be revealed to you when you're ready. I love this. So it's like literally just focus on the next step. You don't need to focus on step seven, eight, nine, 10, because that will come. I love that so much because I think a lot of times when we set goals, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. I don't know how I'm going to get there. And a lot of times not knowing how I'm going to get there is what stops people from from going for it. So it's like, if you just can create like, what's today's step? Once you finish today's step, okay, what's tomorrow's step? I, I think that makes it more manageable and also like more fun, you know, like being able to like, okay, I just have to conquer like this one thing. That's right. That's right. And I think, well, one of the things that I do is I like to write, I'm a cross offer or a check person. <laughs> yeah. So like I create a little note, right. Or a little list of things that I need to accomplish the next day. And then I get to cross them off. So yeah. towards my goal. Okay. I can do this. I need to be doing this. So then I cross it off and it's like a little victory. And we need to be able to celebrate those little victories because at the end of the day, we're our best cheerleaders. And that goes back to reflection. And if you don't get to know yes. yourself, then, you know, you have the creek without the paddle because you're looking for, again, outward validation when it needs to come from inside because it's your goal. Mm, I love that. And, you know, a question I think that would be good to ask yourself at the end of each day is like, did I get closer to my goal today? Like it could be like the tiniest step forward, but just really kind of reflecting. And that could be a good way to kind of track progress as well as just asking that kind of journaling question. Yeah. Another great question too, is who did I help? Because the most Mm -hmm. people you help, right? It's the giving starts the receiving process. Yes. So the more you give, the more you receive. And you're not giving with the intent of receiving because that's called trading. You <laughs> right. To, right. So you want to genuinely give. And the more you do that, then it creates self-value. And then that's attached to self-worth. And when we have more self-worth, we're able to take bigger actions because we have confidence. And ultimately it starts with all of that. That's huge. And what do you what were the four questions? Um, I think it was four questions that you said towards the beginning about like the, the reflection questions. One of them was who did I help? Who helped me? What were the other ones? So what are you grateful for? Well, I always ask my kids, like, how was your day today? So that's just, you know, an open discussion, but, um, what are you grateful for? Who did you help and who helped you? So what is your, like, um, what, like, a random act of kindness. Yeah. So could you do a random act of kindness for and things like that? But my little, little ones, I call it hashtag the challenge and they mm-hmm. beat it up. I'm like, I'm like, guys, hashtag the challenge. And they jump and they finish the hashtag. <laughs> and yeah, it's super cute. But I give them tasks, like write a letter to the janitor and tell them mm-hmm. why you appreciate them and things like that. Because then it teaches them like doing something good makes you feel good. And when you feel good, you're able to do more good. And you have more confidence because so it's all attached, right? So I think that sometimes we lose sight of those little things. So it's important for us to to kind of bring them back to that. Oh, so good. So good. Okay. So I want to kind of jump back to the book a little bit, because I think this is something really, really cool. When I was first reading the book about, you know, your experience sitting on the plane and like my skin was crawling a little bit because I hate sitting on planes. I sometimes get anxiety when I'm sitting on planes and I don't know what's going to happen. And that kind of happened to me recently. And I was able to like, totally just be so calm and and so chill, kind of like, you know, you learn to be, Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, around dealing with challenges, dealing with obstacles, how important is your perspective of said challenge? It's all about perspective. Yeah. It's all about, it's all, we talked about that earlier. It's all relative, right? So sometimes like I'll draw a circle 
and it's a little circle. Let's say it's this big and I say, is a circle big or small? And they're like, okay. And then I make a bigger one. Is this circle big or small? And they're like, okay, well that's big. And I make a bigger one. Is that circle big or small? Like, What's bigger? Then I compare <laughs> the small one to the little one. And I'm like, which one is bigger? And then they tell me this one. And I'm like, okay. So I delete this one and I make the bigger one. Which one is bigger? So I'm like, how many times did you change your mind in the last 20 seconds? And they're like, you know, five, six, seven times, because it's everything that you related yeah. to you is what gives you your perception. And oftentimes yeah. we're like misleaded by what we see, because like, we don't see with our eyes. We see through our eyes. We see through cells of imagination, right? So we cells of recognition. So I think there's always a lesson to be learned. There's always a flip side of the coin. It's like the, like, what is it called? The law of, I don't know what it's called. Polarity, the law of polarity. Mm, you can't yeah. have an up without a down. You can't have an in without an out. You can't have these things. So if there's bad within it, there's also good there's within good. it. Yeah. But it's whatever you're training yourself to see. So sometimes it's like, oh my God, this sucks. Yeah, it really does suck. But then if you pull yourself, how many times do you pull yourself away a month later, a week later, and you're like, oh, that's a lesson or this is why this happened, right? But in the yeah. moment, it's hard because you're living it and you're emotionally attached to whatever's happening. So I think the important thing is really the perspective of, and I'm saying this with ease. I understand it's not that easy. It takes <laughs> yeah. work, right? I'm saying mm -hmm. this because, I mean, I'm still working on it. Sometimes things happen. And I'm like, are you kidding me? But then I'm like, okay, what's the lesson in this, right? Asking yourself better questions and goes back to that. And I'm, I think the first thing in learning how to, you know, develop better perspectives is just being aware of like how you're perceiving a certain situation. Like, ah, I see that I'm perceiving this as like a horrible experience, but like, I don't have to choose this. Like I can choose to like, just let it, let it be what it is instead of like trying mm -hmm. to fight it. And I like to use the example of traffic, like sitting in traffic. Right. And maybe teenagers don't care as much if they're not driving or whatever. Um, but like sitting in traffic, you, one person could be absolutely fuming and mad and like, Oh, hey, high anxiety. And another person could just be like, Oh, this is a great opportunity for me to just be with my thoughts and for me to relax and for me to, you know, listen to a podcast or like whatever it is. But it's like, I think using that example of like being in traffic is a good example of like you, you decide, like you get to choose how you are in any situation, good or right. perceived good or bad. That's right. And I think when you blame outward circumstances, you're giving away your power. Yes. Oh my gosh. Right? Tell me more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's go back to your, to your traffic thing. I heard one time and it was like, somebody called this guy that was stuck in the LA traffic and she was hearing this horn and honking, honking. And she was like, where are you? And this guy responded, I am in the monastery of the LA traffic. Oh, I think I've heard about like, that. Yeah. Right. So it's just funny. It's all a matter of perspective and, and, and how you decide. And like you said, like your choice is a big one. And we don't realize how many choices we make on the daily. And we are always saying, well, he made me feel this way. So he might've led you to feel this way, but you decided to accept the choice of feeling this way. And, and I think that we don't give yourself enough credit, which is often why we're looking for outward circumstances for validation. Yeah. Um, but the more we blame our circumstances, it's his fault, it's her fault, it's this, that, and the other, we don't take responsibility for our lives. Yes. And, then, and then we grow into beings that say, well, this didn't happen because of so, so, and so. Well, in my opinion, that's, that's a shallow life to live because we have more power than that. And I think that once we start taking responsibility for how we're feeling um, and how we're behaving, then we remain in control and yes. when we remain in control. Then we're not phased by all the, you know, pros and cons and, yes. you know, winds of blowing of life because you're able to maintain a little bit more of a stability yes. um, emotionally mm -hmm. and intellectually. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the mottos I've learned just throughout this pandemic for me was, um, I use a different word, but I'm going to use the, the <laughs> version here, but is to not live things twice, right? Because our brain doesn't know mm -hmm. between, can really make a difference between what's real and what's imagined. Yes. That's why VAR is so interesting because you put that on and the world whole crumbles behind you and your heart rate goes up and you're starting to sweat because even though it's imagine, imaginated, right? So it, your brain can't tell between what's real and what's imagined. Mm -hmm. So why live something that's coming in the future? If you're living in the present moment, generally speaking, you don't really have that much anxiety. Yes. You're always anxious and stressed about what's to yes. come. So why are you living that twice? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Live it then, but you don't have to embody it twice. Oh, mic drop. <laughs> I love that so much. I love yeah. that. 
And as you were talking about that, it kind of made me think like, um, you know, there's so many things that happen in our lives where, you know, let's say for me, my injury when I was young, like I thought it was the worst thing ever and what good could possibly come of this or, you know, didn't not making a team or whatever. There's so many obstacles and hardships in our life where in the moment we're like, this is the worst thing ever. And we see it as like this end all be all like, have you ever had an experience? I'm sure you have, but I'd love to hear like, what experience have you had in your life? That was maybe really, really difficult at the time, but looking back on it, you were able to see like, wow, this actually, you know, turned out to be a really, really good thing. Hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, I think I have several, but just to go back to somewhat the familiar here um, and bring it back to my book, like when yeah. for, for the listeners, if you get the chance to read it, you'll get to know this, but I was stuck in this big blackout and I was 14 years old with no cell phone or anything. So that's the end all be all yeah. no way to like reach out to family. No, I mean, we had landlines back then, you know, there's a long <laughs> line. So all of these things, right. You think it's the end, like you don't know, but then it forces you to problem solve. And I think to me, I didn't know at the time why I went through that or the hardship I had to face to go through that. Yeah. But it wasn't only until 15, 16 years later, I'm like, I'm going to write a book about it. Right. So mm-hmm. it's like, you never know. Like it took me 15 years to be like, <laughs> yeah. maybe this is why I went through that. You know? So sometimes it, you, you know, you look back at things and this is where you learned the lesson. And I've had some hardships in my life too, where with family and things, those things are yeah. hard. They're hard on the emotional, but you get to learn lessons from that. Like, I think mm-hmm. life is a school of growth, right? And I think that if you, if you really take the time to reflect, you'll be able to find that the lesson, even though it doesn't take away the pain or the hardship, yeah. but I think I, that helps you become the person you want to become. And the question was asked to me a while back and I was asking the same question. If you could go back in time, would there, would there be anything in your life that you would change? So I'm going to ask you that question mm-hmm. before I answer. So go ahead. What do you think? I would say absolutely not. Um, Just because I know I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't have learned the lessons. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. I'm talking to you. I wouldn't be doing what I love to do. So no, I wouldn't change anything. Exactly. So that was my same answer because if I go back, like you said, to change something, I wouldn't be the same person I am today. And I like the person that I am today and I know I can be better. Yeah. And I want to strive towards that, but I like who I am. So I don't want to go back and change that yeah. person. And I, you know, and I encourage people to really reflect on that question too, because yeah. if we're always living in the past, we're living with grief and we're living mm-hmm. with regret. And, and it was, there was a study that was published a while back and it was like guilt and grief have the highest pH in your sweat. Mm-hmm. Right. And we know it's acidic yeah. and we know what acid does to the body. And then it goes back to the cool, like we don't die, we kill ourselves because we are always embodying these things and we're not able to release, like we're living in the past or we're living in the future with constant stress or, you know, guilt or burden. So we want to come back to the present really and just try to live our best lives. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And that like, I feel like that kind of ties it all together with perspective, which has been a huge thing, right? And then just being, being in the moment, like learning to reflect and just be Mm -hmm. and and not always live in the the past or always living in the future. Cause yeah, like you said, the past is guilt, right? It's mm-hmm. grief and the future is anxiety. At least that's what it would be for me. Um, so yeah, this is, I love this conversation so much. <laughs> it's I'm enjoying it too, honestly. <laughs> I love it. So I, I want to talk more um, about first, where can people like get your book? Um, you can get it on Amazon if you just type in my name. So L-O-U-I-S-E, Louise Arsenault. So I'll, I'll put in the chat or something, you can set it out, but um, there's a lot of silent letters and you can also find it on my website. So louisearsenault.com. So that's another place where they can find the book. Cool. Awesome. So I want to get into one more kind of quick question. Um, Cause I know, I know you're a coach. I know you're a really, really good one. Okay. Um, and, and for coaches, uh, I want to know from you, what are some things you do to help instill confidence in your players? So one of the things for me that I've done with a lot of my teams is I challenge them like but from the young age, the little ones have like the challenge. That's one of them. Yeah. Um, for my older ones, I ask them better questions and I hold them accountable. So I think that accountability um, piece, like we don't realize, but kids like structure. Yeah. And we live in a day and age where again, it's instant gratification and they, they tend to 
to get away with a little bit more sense of entitlement. So I don't know how you grew up, but for me, like it was a grind when yes. I grew up as, you know, and, and I think that as society's moving forward, there's a lot of pros, but I see a lot of setbacks when it comes to like children and their development because they've not faced much adversity. So therefore they have a hard time dealing with any adversity and then they turn to their parent and their parents are fighting their battles for them. Yep. So I tell all my kids all the time, I don't want to hear from your mom. If you have an issue with playing time with your teammates, like I want to hear from you because I don't like your mom can be an echo to your message. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I can always welcome a second text or a second, you know, whatever from her conversation, but I want to hear from you because at the end of the day, like you and I are working collaboration. So Mm -hmm. in order to instill confidence in them, giving them the power back to realize that they are the ones that can make choices and they can, by making their choices again, it is attached to their um, self-worth, right? And it works on their confidence. And the more they feel better about themselves, doing hard things is hard. Yeah. But doing hard things brings also value. So it helps you develop as a better human being. Um, And I also do a lot of um, community building aspects. So I do a lot of team bonding within my team, but we do like shoe cutting parties and we cut shoes from jeans and we send those shoes to Africa and we go pack food and we've done, you know, a lot of those things because then it gives them a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it helps Mm -hmm. them. and, And again, you're feeling good. And when you feel good, you do good things. So it helps them be more confident and just embodying who they are and respecting who they are as people. Yeah. And you're just, you're, yeah. And you're like, you're helping them to just become better human beings. And like, absolutely, like that's, that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And like you said, like giving them the power and you give them the power by empowering them to, to speak out for themselves, to stand up for themselves, to stay accountable to their goals. And I think this is an important message for coaches and parents, because parents need to know that the more they fight their kids' battles, the more they, the kids will be entitled and won't be able to handle adversity. Right. Right. And like, that's something you have to have in life. And then for coaches to, to like set the stage and say, Hey parents, I don't want to hear from you. Cause there's so many times where parents will ask me like, Oh, should I talk to the coach or should my daughter talk to the coach? And, and so there's obviously some lack of communication there, but I think just for coaches to like setting a really clear boundary, like this is like the kids, the kids have to talk to me. Parents, you're like, you can echo, you can support, but like, you're not in this. That's right. I love that. And it's funny because I was putting some time into, and, and I'm going to maybe spill before I talk to my, to the parents, but I want <laughs> to ask some of my parents, like if you were in the woods by yourself and there was a butterfly in a cocoon and it is struggling, right? Mm-hmm. Would you help it? I don't know. What's the answer? I want to know the answers from the parents, right? And I'm sure some of them would be like, yeah, like your innate desire is to want to help, right? Yes. But we all know if we do that, it actually ends up killing the butterfly yes. because it doesn't develop strength enough. So not as a dramatic fashion, but with the kids, like you're not killing your kid by any means, but you're taking away part of their power and you're, you're killing their confidence in becoming something greater than, right? So that's kind of like my approach to that. Like, yeah, sometimes you want to fight their battles. Like I have a little nephew, he's struggling sometimes to get up and I'm like, I want to help him. Yeah. But like, I take a step back because it's not about me. It's about his development or it's about like parents need to understand and as coaches, it's not about me as a coach. I'm making choices as a coach. I'm mm-hmm. also my mind and my heart is on your kid's development. So how can we use the medium of sport to teach them to become better human beings? And they do that, they grow through adversity. Love it. I like that example of the butterfly in the cocoon. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. It, it's like, it really is like exactly, I mean, it, literally you're not killing yeah. them, but I mean, no. you are like, you know, doing them such a disservice. A of them. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. So I, I I absolutely love that example. Um, And I want parents listening to this to really (laughs) actually take that in and ask yourself that question and, and really, you know, think about, you know, what we're talking about here, because it's so powerful. It is powerful. And I have another one for you because I was reading this article that they created this controlled environment where like it was just sun and there was no wind. And it was, it was like a controlled environment Mm -hmm. where they grew trees. Yes. And they didn't, what they noticed is that after a certain height, the tree would just fall over. Oh, wow. And they couldn't understand why it was. And then they discovered is because there was no wind to help strengthen the roots. So because <laughs> there was no adversity, 
the trees kept falling because there was nothing to make them stronger at the base. So I think when we're looking at it that way, adversity helps us stay grounded and it gives us strength, right? Like when you go through that, you're the one that goes through it, it gives you power again. So mm-hmm. it enables you to be doing bigger. Yeah. yeah. And that goes back to when you asked me the question, would I change anything? It's like, no, because I wouldn't right. be as, you know, physically or mentally resilient as if I didn't go through those things. So yeah, That's I right. love that. So I want to kind of end with asking, um, talking about your juggling program. I know you have this really yeah. awesome juggling program. So please tell us more about that and kind of where, where people can learn more about it. Yeah. So they can learn about it more on my website. The same thing, louisearson.com. It's under coaching. Um, but the reason why I decided to develop this is because I, in the U S people don't spend as much time on the ball yeah. on their spare time. Right. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, how can I figure out a way to help my players get better without necessarily taking time from practice? They can do stuff on their own. Mm-hmm. So I came up with this program. It's called the pyramid juggling program. It's designed um, to give each player a minimum of 9,900 juggles. If they make no mistake at all, um, that's from start to finish, but players are going to make mistakes. So you're looking at anywhere between 25 to 45,000 touches on the ball. Um, and it's a way for me to be able to coach kids without being limited to the field. So mm-hmm. I'm able to cast a wider net. So I have like kids that are in Canada that are doing it right now. And I have kids, you know, that are in Texas and I have kids from all over and it helps create that kind of community, sort of like what you're doing and it allows us to kind of like be able to reach out um, wider, but it's a really fun program. It starts very basic. It's a bilateral program. Um, So it Mm -hmm. improves bilateral improvement. You Mm -hmm. cannot move on from your dominant foot. If you don't pass it with your (laughs) non-dominant, both feet are going to get better. Um, And it teaches the art of like goal setting, goal achieving. Um, It helps with your first touch, of course, and all these different aspects kind of like entwined into my program. Nice. And I know that we, when we talked earlier, you were telling me some of the stories of, of like the, the girl that went from, I don't want to say the numbers, but she was started with this, like, tell us some of those cool stories. So I had a, a kid, she was eight when she started, she turned nine throughout the process, but she started her max juggle was four. I mean, and I'm talking, it was, it was a grind to get four. <laughs> her maximum juggle was four. She finished her program um, about in a month and a half, maybe two months. And then she was at 120. So from four to 120, right? In about a month and a half, two months. And then she kept working and then she hit the thousands and she just recently beat her record. She said 3,000 and like 63 or something. And she's 10. That's like, unreal. Hey. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that seriously like blows my mind. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only one. I've had several of them. I had a player that started with, I think her max juggle was like 1600. So she's already starting like pretty well up there. So she finished my program and she was hitting like 25, 2600. She she upped her juggling record by a thousand. Like that's huge in and of itself, right? So it really is for all walks. And I have some of my teammates do it too like 34 years old and they're like Arr! grinding and they're like so competitive. So it's been fun. It's been really I don't, fun. Yeah. I was going to say, it's like, cause so many times it's like, we kids don't get out. Cause it's like, Oh, it's not fun. But I imagine when you have like a fun challenge like this, like it, it just, it just brings so much more fun, right. which really is like the recipe to, to getting better on the ball is just going out there and to get in touches. That's right. But then it goes back to what we're talking about goal setting, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Celebrating the little victories. So totally. as they're progressing, they're yeah. celebrating those little wins, right? They're checking that thing. They're crossing it off. Yeah. And they're taking daily steps towards what their, their goal is. So totally. oh, love it. so cool. So Lou, um, we know where to get the book. We know where to get the juggling program. Like tell us social media, where can girls connect with you? Parents, coaches, where can they find you and learn more about you? Yeah. So social media for the juggling program, it's at pyramid juggling program. Um, and then just my right personal juggling social media, I mean, juggling personal social media <laughs> it's at Louise underscore Arsenal. Awesome. So you can find me on Instagram. And I also have a Facebook page for both. So Sweet. Louise Arsenal and then Pyramid Juggling Program. Awesome. We will link all of those up in the show notes so people can access awesome. your book and guys get the book. I just started it, um, but it's already like, it's really, really entertaining. And obviously there's so many life lessons. So go get the book, go check out the juggling program. And Lou, thank you again so much. This has been one of my favorite conversations. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Shay, thank you so much for you know having me and for all that you're doing for the community too. Like your stuff is bomb. So thank you. Thank you.